Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 14. We're, going to, we're continuing on through the Gospel of John. Obed and his family are going to be here, uh, you know, after church, obviously, and, and uh, Obed speaks English, and uh, Carmen probably understands English. Yeah, you do. You're shaking your head. <laughs> so just encourage you to say hello to them. Once again, I've been ministering with this guy uh, a couple times a year for about 13 years, and it's just, uh, just beautiful to have relationships with people where you have the same mind and the same heart for God, and... Um, it's just tremendous, you know, so I'm um, so glad you guys are here. Thank you, yeah. John chapter 14 is where we are at. We're gonna study only one verse, but I'd like to read verses one through six for context, and we'll obviously continue on with the other verses next week. Jesus is speaking at the Last Supper to his disciples. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you've made it clear. Uh, You've given us a path. You've given us access to heaven. You've given us a way to be with you forever. Thank you, Jesus, that you didn't offer yourself as an option, but as the exclusive way. And uh, it's really clear to us, and, and so many of us have experienced you in that way. Lord, we have discovered that you are the way and the truth and the life, and and we are uh, convinced of that in our hearts, and we are following you, and it's our intention to follow you all of our days, Lord. And so we ask that you'd keep us, and we know that it's your intention and promise to keep us as well. And Lord, we pray that you'd speak to us through your word today and um, help our hearts to not be troubled. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Verse one, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. That's our verse for the day, just one verse, but it's packed full of application and packed full of things to think about. We're gonna kind of divide this thing up. Uh, The first part is about troubled hearts, and then the second part is about an answer for troubled hearts, and then the first part about the first part (laughs) is the disciples and their troubled heart and our troubled hearts, and then their remedy and then our remedy. So. Uh, Jesus here in John chapter 13, just previously, they're at the Last Supper, he's been announcing a number of things to them and uh, his announcements have caused their hearts to be troubled. He's told them that he's going to be betrayed. He said, one one of you here is a betrayer and you're gonna betray me. He has been telling them for a while and told them again that um, he's going to be given over to wicked men who will brutalize him and ultimately kill him. In John chapter 13, he had taken time to wash their feet, which is the job of a slave. Uh, They realized that they had neglected uh, to care about the men around them, and Jesus, their master, their teacher, takes the lowest place and puts on a towel, girds himself with a towel, and takes a wash basin and goes around to each one of them washing their feet. And so there was you know, a great deal of, I would say, a, a holy humiliation there. I'm sure they were really regretting that they hadn't done that. Um, there's a lot that's going on here. They had followed him for three and a half years and they had left everything. The, the, the manner of life in that day was that if you found a rabbi that you felt your heart was attached to, you would just kind of drop everything if you were able and you just, you just live with them. You would just, you know, Jesus was an itinerant preacher, so wherever he went, they went. Sometimes they stayed in people's houses. Sometimes I imagine they camped out under the stars, but they were with him, you know, 24 seven, three and a half years. And so they had grown accustomed to having a life with Jesus. Living with Jesus was, was the norm for them. They had seen miracles, they had heard his, heard his teaching, uh, they had seen his wisdom in action as he had uh, answered people that were challenging him verbally and you know, philosophically trying to trap him in his words and that kind of thing. Life with Jesus was the norm. And as we have been studying the Gospel of John, we've also realized, and history helps us out on this, that they were expecting a political messiah. And we need to remember that Israel was under the thumb of Rome at this time. And so there's Roman soldiers everywhere. They were an occupied country. And so in their mind, they're looking for a king who will come be a political and a military deliverer. They had expectations of Jesus. 
uh, their understanding of the Old Testament brought them to believe that he was here to drive out the Romans, restore Israel to her days of glory. But the, the main point that I really want us to focus on is that they had a life with Jesus, day in, day out. They had grown to know Jesus. They understood him. They were growing in their understanding. They were familiar. They had friendship. They had relationship with him. And now he's announced that it's all going to change. And it's going to change in a horrible way, and it's going to change in a, in a brutal way, and in, in a betraying way. And it's no wonder at all that their hearts are troubled. It's just, it's not a surprise at all. And what I really, really like about this, that Jesus doesn't get on their case. I mean, he, they didn't say, my heart's troubled. My heart, oh, mine too. Mine. They weren't volunteering this information to Jesus. All he has to do is make the announcements, see their face, and he knows their, their hearts are troubled. And he doesn't scold them about it. And I really, really love that. He doesn't get on their case. He knows that they're just mere men. The same kind of thing can happen with our hearts, obviously. We can become troubled when what we know of life with Jesus suddenly changes. And that's really kind of what I want you to think about because probably the majority of people in the room, you know, we've decided to follow Jesus and maybe some of you haven't and obviously it's our hope and God's supreme hope that you will decide to follow Jesus and, and be saved and be forgiven and have life with him and know his wonder and his glory and his, and his love and comfort and his pardon and all of that. But followers of Jesus are not immune to these kinds of things where life with Jesus is, is moving along and then suddenly it changes. And some, sometimes it changes tremendously and radically. I've told you about uh, my friend Jim down in uh, Orange County, Yorba Linda area. Debbie and I have known Jim and Vicki since our first year of marriage. Uh, as it turns out, he was a hunter, fisherman, backpack guy, so we spent a lot of times backpacking, hunting, fishing, sleeping in tents and getting our feet wet from the rain and all that stuff together, you know. And he went on to become a hang glider and he, you know, if it was dangerous, he would do it kind of thing, you know. He was just a, a thrill seeker kind of guy. Me, I have a tremendous fear of heights. About a six foot ladder is my limit. After that, I'm like ready to, you know, lose my cookies, you know. It's just like, <laughs> but this guy would like soar, literally like soar with the eagles. They would go so high in hang gliding that they take oxygen tanks. That's kind of extreme, you know. So he was that kind of guy. Being that kind of guy, he has lots of accidents. He tore up his shoulder, went into the hospital for shoulder surgery, and came out a paraplegic. Terrible malpractice. He didn't deserve that. They're, they're just going along with Jesus. And life changed radically with him, you know? And very easily, Jesus, I'm sure, said to him, don't let your heart be troubled. As I said, Debbie and I were down in Southern California this week and uh, visiting you know, a lot of pastors and that kind of thing. And, and this guy, uh, Steve Marquez, you may have read about him in the Calvary Chapel magazine. You can read his story, it's out in the foyer. But um, he had a problem in the lower abdominal area, went in, and his wife is the kind of gal, she's already been through some surgery, so she's looking it up online and, and self-educating. And they go into the doctor, and the doctor says, yeah, it's this. We'll, we'll just fix it real quick. And she says, wait a minute. Doesn't, isn't that always connected with kidney cancer? Oh, no, no, not at all. I'm sure it's connected, and the doctor just kind of wrote her off. By the way, I'm not, I'm not against doctors, okay? I'm just telling you some stories. I'm not, this isn't a crusade against Western medicine, please, you know. But she was insisting, no, you know, from what I've read, 100% of the time, this problem is also connected with kidney failure. No, no, no. So they took care of the, the minor problem and sent him home. Two months later, he's back in there, and every doctor he saw said, why, why didn't they connect this with kidney cancer? It's all up to your spine now. And he had L3 and L4 removed. And now he has an internal metal cage holding him up. And it was a very aggressive cancer. He lost one kidney, but he lost part of his spine, and it was because of a misdiagnosis from a doctor. Life changed radically for Steve and Monica Marquez. Good guy. In fact, he was the pastor where Vic and Phyllis Boxetter were attending. A lot of you knew, knew them. And so life changed radically. So Jesus would say to them, let not your heart be troubled. And, and our hearts can be troubled in you know, a hundred different ways, right? Finances or our own health or relationships fall apart, marriages fall apart, churches fall apart. A lot of things can happen where we can suddenly find ourselves, you know, we've just been like the disciples, just living with Jesus, 
just going through life with Jesus and we just get blindsided with a cancer or a, a whatever the case may be. Another friend of ours, missionaries from Mexico, you guys, uh, Obed and, and Carmen know them, uh, Robin Cindy Lee. He's on a ladder. Up, he returned from Mexico back to Canada to their home to start a new work in Vancouver, a new, new uh, ministry in Vancouver. He's on a ladder. He falls down, hits his head. While they're checking that, they find out that he has cancer. He has to have his leg amputated. <laughs> Don't get to know me too well. <laughs> he might be in danger. <laughs> You know, that's why I never want to go to the doctor because they just find stuff that's wrong with you, you know, it's just. <laughs> Life with Rob and Cindy changed radically. He took his leg off way above, you know, the, the, from the hip bone. Just, it's gone, you know. And so Jesus said to the disciples, don't let your heart be troubled. And he says to us, when those things happen, you know, we're just going along with life. Don't let your heart be troubled. And, and in that way, we are not unlike those disciples, we go through many of the same things. So look at, look at the answer for their troubled heart. Look at what Jesus said to them. He knew that they were troubled and he didn't want them to be. I love that. He was proactive. He, he saw their faces. There's, there's no written dialogue. I'm sure they were talking about things and there's kind of a little undercurrent there going on at that last supper at the table as he's made these announcements. But he's, he, Jesus is proactive and he's upfront about not wanting to let his friends have to battle with a troubled heart. He cared about them, he obviously cares about us as well. The troubling came because of failed expectations. As I said, and historically we know this, they expected a political Messiah. Even, even if Jesus didn't turn out to be the political Messiah, he, he told them that he was gonna be killed. And he told them that one of them was gonna be the betrayer. That's enough to just kind of ruin life as you know it in the moment. And so, there's great troubling going on in their hearts. And he spoke to them directly about that which was troubling them. He's gonna address it here, uh, specifically that he's going to prepare a, a mansion for each one of them, a place to be with God forever. But we're kind of dealing with just verse one in a more general sense today, verses two through six and on in a more specific way next week. I just felt like, let's just talk about having a troubled heart today in a general sense. He told them, this is his answer for them, he, this is his remedy for them. Believe in me the same way that you believe in God the Father. Now these men were Jewish men. They understood that the one called Yahweh in the Old Testament was the creator and sustainer of all things. They worshiped him. They paid tithes to the temple to support the worship of God. They had a relationship with God and believed in, in Yahweh as the supreme being, but Jesus is saying to them, I want you to put that same degree and, and equality of faith in me, which is really a huge claim to deity by Jesus. You believe in God, believe also in me. I mean, unless you're divine yourself, that's an arrogant, radical statement. But tucked into that thing is his whole claim of divinity. But his solution for them is, I want you to believe in me. I want you to put your faith in me. I want you to trust me. I want you to trust who I am, who I have been to you. I want you to trust what I have said. And there are things that are gonna happen that you haven't seen yet, but because that you know me, I want you to trust that I'm gonna bring those things to pass in the ways that I've told you I'm gonna bring them to pass. For we walk by faith and not by sight. What he was gonna do for them was, had not been seen or really even imagined by them in the way that he's gonna describe it. And so faith isn't having a detailed plan of everything, the next 10 things that God's gonna do and the calendar of when he's gonna do them. It's having faith in the person of Jesus, having confidence that he's got your back and that he's gonna work things out for your good. Paul tells us as much in, in Romans 8, 28, doesn't he? For we know that all things work together for good for the called ones of God according to his purpose. And so he's asking them and he's saying, I am, I am the remedy to your troubled heart. I know you have a troubled heart, I am the remedy. Look at your notes here, there's some, some interesting uh, definitions for us. Let not your heart be troubled. The word troubled means to have a stirred heart or an agitated heart, to have inward commotion or to perplex the mind with doubts or to throw into confusion. 
It's not just emotions, guys, but it's emotions that are always tied together with confusing thoughts. As I said, they had certain expectations. They had a certain mental expectation about Jesus. They had a certain mental recognition of Jesus. But now it's all gonna be, what has been true is true and will stay true, but now more is gonna happen, and it's not to their liking or to their expectation. So he's saying, I want you to not have a troubled heart. I don't want your heart to be agitated. I don't want your heart to have inward commotion. I don't want your mind to be filled with doubts, and I don't want you to be thrown into confusion. I think it's really important that we see the coupling together of emotion and thinking. The crazy emotions are a result of of confused thinking or misplaced understanding. He's trying to get their thinking right because as, as the thinking goes, so goes the heart or so can go the heart. Our hearts have an evil inclination to them, an evil tendency just in our natural flesh, but our minds can really come up with things and, and uh, create a lot of confusion. Jesus gave them a command regarding their emotions and thoughts. And I, I, the reason that I want to focus on this today is because, you know, I mean, I'm a person, too. And you guys are persons, people, too. And I talk to a lot of you, and we talk to each other, and some of us share even, you know, more than a, on a casual level. And I know that you guys can get emotionally whacked out. And some of you... I tell that I get emotionally whacked out, but now I've told all of you. <laughs> you know, I can spin, I can, <laughs> you know, I can get weird, you know, in, in, in an unhappy, dark kind of way. We can all have our hearts perplexed, okay? And Jesus really wants to deal, and, and this is really kind of what I want to camp out on. I think that sometimes we can be so emotionally driven that our thinking just, we just unplug our minds. We just unplug what, what we have studied for years about Jesus. Anybody ever notice that? About someone else, not you, of course. Any, have you ever noticed that about someone else, you know? And I think sometimes that we're shocked that we're feeling these things. What did Jesus say? In this world you will have what? Tri trouble and tribulation, but rejoice for I have overcome the world. Jesus guaranteed that we would have tribulation in this world. This world is not our home. We are called pilgrims. We're passing through. Paul told Timothy that the, those who want to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But I'm just, I'm surprised that we're surprised. Don't, don't, okay, this is, this is, I'm giving you permission to never be surprised that you feel weird again. Ever again. Never be surprised that you are thrown into confusion in this lifetime. Never be surprised that you have troubling thoughts or inward commotion. Don't, don't say, how could this be happening? Guys, that's the world that we live in and these are the bodies that we're stuck in and that's just the way that it is. But we cannot be people led by emotion. That's dangerous. I think one of, one of my early cars that I wanted to buy, I wanted to buy, the, I bought this Toyota truck. And one of, the, one of the big selling points was that it had a cool radio. <laughs> I didn't check to see that there was Bondo from car accidents all around the body. It just had a cool radio, you know? It's, we can just make decisions based on, on less than important things. Don't buy a car because of the radio. You can buy a radio later, you know what I'm saying? Don't be moved away because, or don't be perplexed in your mind because somebody said this and now you're feeling this and suddenly, you know, your emotional well-being is kind of under attack. That's just the world that we live in. Don't let your emotions drive your thinking. Let your thinking capture your emotions. That deserves about 22 amens, I think. That's, okay, there we go, there we go. <laughs> We need to be people of God's word. We need to be people of God's spirit and not pushed around by our emotions. Don't get bullied by your emotions. And it happens. And I know, and you know. And you know about me, and I know about you. Sometimes we talk. 
Jesus gave them a command regarding their emotions. And I also love that he did not, he recognized the truth of their condition and he didn't belittle or negate their feelings. If you come to me, I, I'm gonna try to make a promise to you. I, I, I notice the, the working word is try. <laughs> I'm gonna try to promise to you that if you come to me and say I'm feeling this way, I'm never gonna say to you how stupid. How could you feel that way? You call yourself a Christian, how could you ever feel that? Jesus doesn't belittle these men for being perplexed. He doesn't look down on them for experiencing emotion. I think that's one of the things personally that Satan does to us, right? Satan is called in the Bible the accuser of the brethren. And when, I mean, when we, can, when we feel like, I don't know if I can go on, I can't believe this happened to me, what am I gonna do, how's this gonna work out? Sometimes some of us can stand back and look at somebody and say, how immature, they just need to get their life together, what's wrong with them? You know, we belittle people because of the emotions that they're feeling, I, I just don't think we should ever, ever do that. Jesus doesn't do it to us. Jesus didn't do it to them. He didn't blame them for feeling perplexed. He didn't blame them or belittle them for having agitated hearts. Look at guys, look, look at this. I love this verse from the Psalms. Jesus understood that these guys were mere men. Look at Psalm 103. This is us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame and remembers that we are dust. You're dust. <laughs> I'm dust. I mean, take away, take away the liquid. <laughs> There's only dust left, right? It, it's just simply some verses about our frailty. That God remembers that we struggle. And so... Uh, the first, this, this portion of the message is intended to maybe bring some of you some comfort that, you know, you feel nervous or afraid or this or that, and you immediately must, you start asking yourself, I must not be a Christian. What's wrong with me? I can't believe, if I was more serious with the Lord, I wouldn't be afraid. Forget all that stuff. You're not disqualified because you're fearful or agitated or confused or any of that. The Bible doesn't say that anywhere. Instead, Jesus, I mean, he recognized their condition. He didn't belittle them in their condition. Instead, he told them to not allow their hearts and minds to be agitated, or, or should I say stay agitated and stay troubled. This was a choice they needed to make. Guys, when, when weirdness and insanity wraps itself around your heart, it is what it is. That's not a sin. Stuff happens. The fiery darts of the enemy, Paul talks about putting on the helmet of salvation, to, to, uh, the shield of faith, yeah, the shield of faith to fight off the fiery darts of the enemy. I believe those fiery darts are, are impure thoughts or thoughts of doubt or whatever they may be. What are you gonna do now? How are you gonna work it out? That kind of thing. God never criticizes us that those things happen. But what he does say is this, don't stay there. Don't respond like Chicken Little, the sky is falling, what are we gonna do, you know, biting your nails down to the nubs, that kind of thing. It's not a sin to be perplexed, it's a sin to stay perplexed. It's not a sin to be confused, it's a sin to stay confused in a way that produces that kind of emotional agitation. If you're there, okay, you're there. Don't stay there, that's, that's what's at hand. Look what Jesus said, it's real simple. Don't let your heart be troubled. It's a command. Don't let it stay that way. He's not saying you should never be that way, but he is saying don't let it stay that way. For them, this is what, they, this is what he said to them, you believe in God. They, they were followers of Yahweh, the, the God of the Old Testament as they understood him. They were followers of God. He said, I want you to also believe in me in the same way and it's presented as a command to them. Believe, the word believe, to place one's trust in another. The disciples needed to rise above their fears and confusion and put their faith in Jesus. He's asking them to have a like and equal faith in him as they do in the, as they do in the Father. You believe in Yahweh God, I want you to believe in me in the same way. These guys had lives to live. They had callings upon their life. 
They had children and spouses and grandchildren and family and friends to enjoy and places to go and serve God. And staying agitated and staying confused and staying, continuing, allowing troubled hearts to continue was gonna hinder all of that or maybe even stop it. I'm gonna go off, go off the notes for a minute here. I, you know, well, I've told you enough about myself. You can fill in the blanks pretty much any way you want. <laughs> but I used to hate books that had the kind of title that said happiness is a choice. Anybody ever hate those kind of books? Just anybody other? Am I alone? Okay, one, two, three, four. Raise your hands, people. There's more of us here than we were. Okay. I used to hate those kind of books. I hate, I would never read them. What do you mean happiness is a choice? You must have a wonderful life. You must live at Disneyland on Main Street and everything's perfect all the time and Mickey Mouse is your neighbor and somebody makes you breakfast every day. You got a perfect life. You don't understand anything about life. Hey, you know, I don't like your book and I don't like you, you know. <laughs> Uh, that, that, I, I used to feel that a lot because I just resented that somebody was trying to tell me that I had a choice to not feel bad. I hated that. I'm just being honest with you. But they were right. Doesn't mean that we don't go through stuff. Everybody goes through stuff. Everybody's a victim. Everybody's a victim in the room one way. Or, if not, we'll just, you know, give you a noogie on the head as you go out the door and then you can join the victim club, you know. Everybody's gone through something. But, but Jesus is saying, look, I don't want you to stay there. And we can be very much wrapped up in, in what has happened to us or feel, do you think maybe these guys are feeling that Jesus has let them down even? That's a possibility. And some of us here today might feel like God has let us down. And you just can't let go of it. You just, and it's just the thing, it's now the new thing that you hold on to. But it's, it leaves you with a troubled heart and Jesus is saying, you know what, don't stay there. Do not stay there. Get out of there. Get out of that mindset. And he's telling them how to do it. And he's commanding them to do it. He doesn't blame them that they feel that way, but he's commanding them to not stay that way. Let's look at the other side of the notes here. If you're not there already, Jesus' answer for us. He says, I want you to believe in me. What's true for them, what was true for them is true for us. I've said this already, the Bible never condemns us for the troubling feelings that come upon us. And these things come without our permission and they come without invitation. They just come. A real interesting verse there, and, and let me say this, Jesus also struggled with troubling emotions and thoughts just like we do. That's not, that's not um, an irreverent thing to say about Jesus. Jesus was fully God, fully man, and he struggled with emotions. Look at Hebrews 4.15. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. It says in another part in the book of Hebrews that Jesus cried vehemently to the one who could save him. And that means cried, yelled out, raised his voice in the garden of Gethsemane. Oh, Father, if this cup can pass from me, let it pass, but if not, your will be done. Jesus felt the deepest emotions and according to Hebrews 4.15, also had the temptations that we do. Now, what does that mean? When something goes sideways with you, somebody treats you badly, let's say, you thought the relationship was good, friendship was good, marriage was good, whatever was happening, it's all good, and then suddenly everything goes sideways. What are some of the temptations? Maybe revenge, or trying to fix it in your own power, or try to force this person to like you again, or whatever we might want to do to alleviate the kind of the emotional pain that we're feeling. Jesus had all those temptations. Did, did Jesus maybe think, you know, I know that Judas has to betray me, but man, I sure feel like talking him out of it. <laughs> you ever thought about that? Peter said, Lord, even if the other ones deny you, I'll never deny you. Peter, he said, Peter, you're gonna deny me three times and I'm gonna be there laughing in your face when you do it. I mean, that's my wicked heart. You know, I'm not trying to suggest that Jesus said, but he felt, are you with me? I'm not trying to demean Jesus. Man, I feel like I'm digging a hole. Should I keep digging or stop? Are, are you guys with me? The emotions that we feel he felt. Loneliness, resentment for being lonely. If anybody, you ever, nobody likes being misunderstood. I hate being misunderstood. Jesus was radically misunderstood, don't you think? They, called, they said he was in league with the devil. 
He was blamed for things that he had nothing to do with. His birth was questionable, considered illegitimate. His origin, brought into the world in shame, they said, okay? My, my only point is that Jesus struggled with things just like we do, and he was without sin. He never gave in to the shortcuts or the responses, but he struggled just like we do. He understands that. I, I, I don't know, in my own life, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back because there's, there's other things that I would go the opposite direction, trust me. But I don't think I've ever had trouble saying, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you about this. I know you haven't noticed, you know. I, I feel like I can tell God, just, I feel like I can tell him anything, you know. But I have heard that some people feel like they can't tell God everything because he just wouldn't understand. Totally understands. I mean, he knows anyway, right? He sees it all. But you can tell him because he knows, he feels it, he has felt it. And he was, he was so for these guys. He says, I don't want you to have to stay this way. And I don't even blame you that you feel that way. But don't stay that way. God's word to us is that we do not allow ourselves to stay in these conditions and then we have to fight our way out of the emotions. And I want to submit to you that it is a fight to get out of those places. When you're in a deep depression, you've been mistreated or victimized or misunderstood or maybe some of your whole life you've been mistreated or whatever the case may be. Or you feel like God's failed you. What, again, whatever the case may be. Look at, look at the verse here in 1 Timothy. Fight the good fight. And really what the word means, the, the, the conjugation of the word is continue to fight the good fight. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and you have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. It doesn't say fight it on Tuesday and you're done fighting forever. It says continue to fight the good fight. And by the way, the fight that the Christian fights is a good fight. It's not a bad fight. There's a lot of people fighting out there for bad stuff. To fight, to fight in faith is a good fight. But the conjugation of the verb is continual, present, everyday kind of thing. And I've heard people say this. You prayed about it yesterday. Why are you praying about it again today? Because I'm alive <laughs> and I still feel bad? Well, you should just give it up to God and never have to pray about it again. I don't read that in the Bible. And I, I wonder if any of us maybe, you know, have been mistaught or, or duped or Satan got inside our head about something. It's like, I prayed about that three months ago. I, I shouldn't bring it up to God again because if I had faith, it would have gone away. Just keep fighting, right? Amen? Keep fighting. Fight and keep fighting the good fight because our hearts get troubled. What's the, what's the, what's the, what is the fight? I'm not gonna take matters into my own hands. I'm not gonna go crazy. I'm not gonna spin out. I'm not gonna self-medicate and I'm not gonna take revenge or try to change the situation or try to change the person. My fight is to believe that God is gonna take care of me and trust him and move on in that direction. That's my fight. Amen. That's your fight. Amen. That's the fight. And, and then the day when the fight stops is, is the day that we're doing your memorial service. <laughs> when everybody writes rest in peace on your Facebook page. And then you don't have to fight anymore. Until then, there's battles that we have to fight, not constantly, but frequently, right? So we keep fighting. Switching gears, look at number three there. There's a popular phrase that exists today. It says, I am spiritual but not religious. You may have heard that. And I think what that phrase is, I am spiritual but not religious, I think, I think it's a generations particularly push back on organized religion or what is considered organized religion. And, and, and I'm, I'm switching gears here, but the two ideas are gonna meet in, in a few minutes, so just please hang with me. It seems as though, from what I hear and from what I've seen, you know, churches in their efforts to help people get through life try to transform them through behavior modification. They give them a list of things they should or shouldn't do. If you want to be part of this church, this is how you need to dress and this is how you need to act and that kind of thing. And it's some, it seems as though some churches and some pastors are much more concerned with how you behave rather than making Jesus real to you and letting him dictate your heart and lead your heart. So, I've seen that happen. So I think maybe, maybe, and I use all these really vague terms because I'm not saying that I'm the authority on these things, but I think maybe some people are saying, I'm not religious, like you guys that go to church and sit in pews, but I'm spiritual, which means I'm open to having a faith in something. Okay, terrific. Faith in what? Or faith in who? 
And so for the people, if, you know, if maybe some of you are visiting us today, fantastic. I'll just pretend that you're here and talk to you. If, you, if, you're, if you're spiritual but not religious, okay, I get that. I understand that. I don't want to be religious in that way either. But whatever you're spiritual about, you have to ask yourself, what am I putting my faith in? What is the object of your faith? I read one commentary yesterday that a guy said, you know, if you're at point A and you want to get to point B, you can have all the faith in the world that your car can get you from point A to point B, but the car needs to be able to run. It needs to be functional. And then you need to get into the car and actually start it and then drive it over there. So there's the object of your faith. The object of your faith needs to be faith worthy or trustworthy. And then you need to engage with that object of faith and actually kind of let it do what it's going to do for you. And so for whatever anybody's relief, you know, belief system is or any of the millions of people watching on YouTube eventually, you know, millions, right, are watching on YouTube, right? You believe in something? Okay, fantastic. Why do you believe in what you believe? It's just a fair question to ask. Conversely to all of that, Jesus said, I, I want to be the object of your faith. I'm the car that works. The gas tank's never empty. It's, I'm always ready. I can get you from here to there. But you have to get in and, 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 and go there with me. I think that's kind of a neat uh, illustration of faith. The Christian is called to believe in Jesus. The Christian is called to believe in who he is and what the Bible has promised. Guys, when your heart is troubled, Jesus said that he's the answer. If you're a Christian today, a follower of Jesus, and you have a troubled heart, he is still the answer. It doesn't, don't wait for your situation to change in order to, to experience a release of the troubling. You with me? Some of us are like saying, well, if he would just change or she would just change, then I could feel okay. You can feel okay before they ever think about changing because Jesus is the answer to the troubled heart. Each believer, every Christian here, you are responsible for the condition of your heart, not me, not the pastoral staff, not the person you're married to, not your friends, nobody. Your, the condition of your heart, I, I, I'll say this kind of sternly with one hand and lovingly with the other, okay? Maybe a little more love than stern, you know, but, but both things go together. The condition of your heart is completely up to you. And I will confess again, I used to hate people that would tell me that because I thought my situation needed to change before my heart could be okay. Nope, I was wrong. You can have peace that passes what? Understanding. understanding. You can have peace that passes understanding. And you have to fight your way there. And Jesus doesn't blame you for being mad. Some of you have a, have a beautiful and huge right to be mad. Some of you should be mad, and when I hear your stories, I'm mad about what makes you mad too. It's not wrong to be angry. It's not wrong, all these emotions, I don't think they're wrong. It's wrong to stay there. And it's, it's wrong to not fight your way out in faith, trusting in Jesus. Look at this quote by the Nelson's Illustrated Bible Commentary. The simple but profound solution to all of our problems is believing. We do what we do because we believe what we believe. Our actions are nothing more than the product of our deepest convictions. Your response ultimately is a, is a response to what you really, really believe. Not what you say you believe, but what you really believe. The key is what we believe, the object of our faith. Right thinking is basic to right action, and right thinking begins by thinking right about God. Jesus is the answer. He's the cure for the troubled heart. You can't just have a general faith. You can't just be spiritual. Faith has two critical elements, down letter number nine, letter E. The object of faith and the action of faith. Your object of faith may have power to help you. Jesus has power to help you, but unless you put your faith into action, nothing changes. You may be ready to step out in faith, but if your object of faith is powerless to help, you'll be disappointed. Guys, Jesus doesn't want your heart to be troubled. He doesn't. He doesn't promise you trouble-free existence, but he doesn't want you to have to stay in that place over that certain issue. Down at the bottom, I wrote about a guy named Harry Blondin. Harry Blondin was a man who, poop, poop, 
a man who people put their faith in. Let me tell you about Harry Blondin. He was the 1850s equivalent of Evel Knievel. Some of you young people may not know. <laughs> go, go home and, and Google or uh, YouTube Evel Knievel. Anyway, Evel Knievel used to jump over things with a motorcycle. Harry Blondin was a tightrope walker. And this is a true story. He was, in his world, world famous. And he decided to run a rope across Niagara Falls. And he did it. And he walked over Niagara Falls more than 200 times. He had a 26-foot balancing pole made out of ash, made out of wood, and he would balance, and, and people would put bets that he would make it, you know, and he, he, he never fell over 200 times. Sometimes he put a, a table and a chair, tied it on his back with a bottle of champagne, went and put the table and sat on the chair, poured the champagne and drank it, and then tied it back on his back and went. One time he even went, made a, a, took a small oven and cooked an omelet and ate the omelet and then went. That's true, I'm not, I'm not lying. He, in fact, he took his manager and put his manager on his back and took him across. His manager had faith. Then Harry Blondin said, I'm gonna push a wheelbarrow across. And they were making bets. And this guy was saying, I, I totally believe that Harry Blondin can make it. I mean, he always makes it. And the guy says, do you really believe it? He goes, yeah, I'll bet anything. He said, get inside the wheelbarrow. That's the best lesson on faith you'll ever have right there. You believe that he'll make it, but will you be a part of him making it? Right? Let not your heart be troubled. Get in the wheelbarrow. But, 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 Jesus is not gonna fall. He's got you. Did he get in the wheelbarrow? I, I don't know how the story ended up. <laughs> That's your homework assignment. <laughs> See what happens when you talk in church? <laughs> <laughs> Any others? <laughs> no, that's a good question. I don't know. But that's a beautiful illustration, isn't it? Jesus said, look, at you believe in God, believe in me. I don't want you to keep suffering. But, 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 I, Jesus could say I've heard it all before. Everybody suffers. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it stay that way. Put your faith in Jesus. I don't know if we have any questions this morning. Do we have any? I know Jesus understands our suffering, but how can he understand our feelings of guilt or shame? I don't think he can understand our feelings of guilt because he never did anything to feel guilt. But I think he, can feel sh I think he felt shame because of how he was treated. I'm, I'm guessing. The book of Isaiah tells us that he was a man of sorrows. This is, a tie, this is one of the names of Jesus. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The best answer I can give you right now. It's a good question. I can't think of him understanding or feeling guilt. Any thoughts on that, Vince, or Adam, or? I would say um, the guilt that we deserve was put on him. There it is. And even if he can't fully understand it, he's definitely the remover of it. The guilt that we had, he took upon himself. Thank you, beautiful answer. That's why we hire smart people here. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Angie just told him, no, I'm teasing. <laughs> good, good answer. Any other questions? That's it. Warren Wiersbe says, the Christian life, it's not a playground, it's a battleground. But there's a lot of beautiful moments in the Christian life, isn't there? There really are. But don't be surprised when these things come upon you. You're not sinning because you're feeling some ugly feeling. But we are sinning when we stay there, when we choose to stay there. And Jesus doesn't want us to stay there. He doesn't want your hearts to be troubled. But you have to make, a, you, have to make you have to let Jesus dictate to you what the next step is. It might be to forgive somebody. And emotionally, you're not ready. I've forgiven people, done everything within me to forgive and say those words to people that emotionally, I wasn't quite there yet, but in obedience, I'm obeying him. And as I obeyed, my emotions changed. I'm amazed at how our emotions can change as we obey the Lord. So don't wait for your, your humanness to get you to that place. Obey Jesus and he'll change your humanness.
to be more like him. Let's stand together. Thank you, Lord, for your great grace, your mercy, and your love. Thank you for the pardon, forgiveness that's in you. Lord, help us to be people of faith. Father, rescue us, Lord, from our emotionally driven lives at times. Help us, help our default, Lord, to be listening to your spirit and reflecting on your promises. And have your way with us, Lord. Make us better people for your glory. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O my soul. Worship his holy name. God bless you guys. Bless you.